Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's lecture. And we will continue the geologic history of Antarctica and the world, starting with the evolution of dinosaurs and continuing on to their extinction and the gradual transition of, of Antarctica from forests to polar wasteland during the age of mammals or the Cenozoic, which is the era of geologic time that we presently live in. Pictured here is a genus of tree, Nothophagus, which still survives in Australia, but once also lived in Antarctica. And that is evidence for continental drift. Antarctica and Australia were attached until very recently, and we have fossils of trees that were formerly present in Antarctica that still live in Australia. And that also tells us that the climate of Antarctica has changed relatively recently. Antarctica still had forests early on in the age of mammals. And the second half of the lecture will begin the discussion of the modern wildlife of Antarctica. The present terrestrial wildlife of Antarctica is very sparse. There's not a lot that lives on the land today. And the first half of the lecture will guide us to how we got there. The much shorter lecture 7b will be about the survivors of the opening of the Antarctic circumpolar current and the events that turned Antarctica into a dry, cold desert, essentially. And here is today's material. We will be moving from the age of dinosaurs into the age of mammals, and then talking about modern land-based Antarctic life. Since the second half of so is so much more short, I am putting the announcements in that half, in case you're wondering. So at the last lecture, oops, at the last lecture, we ended at the Permian mass extinction, which was a catastrophic mass die off of life and especially of marine life. The fact that marine life suffered such, so much more is likely because it was related to ocean acidification. So at the end of the Permian and after the Permian extinction, we begin the Mesozoic era. And that is known as the age of dinosaurs or more broadly as the age of reptiles in honor of the pterosaurs or AKA the pterodactyls, the flying reptiles, which are not technically dinosaurs, as well as a number of marine reptiles and also including a number of reptiles that evolved to replace the declining mammal ancestors after the Permian extinction. And it also kind of alludes to the fact that the Mesozoic era was very hot by today's standards, including in Antarctica. And the Mesozoic includes the Triassic period in which a number of reptiles evolved, including dinosaurs and dinosaurs become, become the dominant land animal near the very end of the period. The first true mammals, which mostly live in insect eating niches evolve at the end of the Triassic as well. And all of the world's continents are part of Pangaea. Um, during the Jurassic period, after which Jurassic Park is named, which is kind of ironic because most of the dinosaurs there are from the Cretaceous, but the Jurassic is when you have the long neck dinosaurs dominating the land. You have um, a still very hot climate with conifer forests dominating, and Pangaea just barely begins to break up. You get the early Atlantic Ocean and you start getting some separation between Antarctica and the other parts of Gondwana during the Cretaceous period. Um, oh, by the way, also birds, the only surviving dinosaurs evolve at the very end of the Jurassic. In the Cretaceous period, dinosaurs continue to dominate, but they start to decline near the end. Flowering plants also evolve. At the end of the Cretaceous, dinosaurs are almost entirely wiped out by a mass extinction with birds being the sole exception. Pangaea largely breaks up by this point and the continents begin to look more modern, but you still have the, you still have the southern continents together. You still have Gondwana for the Cretaceous period and Antarctica remains attached to other continents, most notably Australia, but also South America throughout the Cretaceous and onto the early age of mammals. Now, the Triassic period be, was the calm after the storm, after the cataclysm of the Permian extinction when massive volcanism ignited coal deposits left behind by the coal swamps of the Carboniferous period. And as life began to recover, it entered a rather different world. Pangaea still existed, and it would continue to exist for much of the Mesozoic era. Um, but the Earth's climate had warmed significantly by the start of the Triassic. 
the ice caps no longer existed at all, and the Earth would not have any ice caps at all again until the Oligocene epoch, which is well into the age of mammals. And this is what I mean when I say that an ice age is defined by when you have any ice caps at all. The dinosaur age was very much not an ice age at all because there was never an ice cap throughout the entire Mesozoic era. And the continental effect, which I mentioned earlier as something that helps keep Antarctica cold and dry, in general leads to extreme temperatures in places where the temper in places where the temperature isn't quite as cold from the latitude already, you get blazing hot temperatures during the day and then freezing cold temperatures at night. You'll notice this if you go out in the desert, it'll be miserably hot during the day. And then at night, you'll desperately need a blanket because it'll be cold. And this effect created hot, dry deserts in areas that are now actually very rainy. Um, the Amazon rainforest, uh, the Amazon area is connected to Africa here in the middle of the southern part of Pangaea. And again, the interior of the continent was was desert. The polar regions were monsoonal, the, but the vast majority of the continent was just really dry. And Antarctica lay close to the South Pole, but not quite as far south as it is now. You can see that it's in what would be the Southern Indian Ocean today. And it had a relatively temperate rainy climate because it was close to 60 degrees south. Um, that's what I meant by the areas, the areas near the poles. The areas that are now polar were actually pretty close to 60 degrees south and rather monsoonal. And they have not actually found any Triassic dinosaurs from Antarctica, but they have found fossils of some other animals like some early synapsids. And the interesting thing about these synapsids is that we find fossils of them on the other southern continents and that provided evidence for Pangaea even existing. They found mammal ancestors like Lystrosaurus, which we'll talk about on the next slide, on in Antarctica, which for one thing indica indicated that Antarctica had been habitable when Lystrosaurus lived, and also in India and Southern Africa. And dinosaurs were not the only reptiles to evolve during the Triassic. There was an evolutionary radiation of reptiles to replace the synapsids, which were still still existed, but were declining and declining in both population and diversity. Um, for example, this Postosuchus from a different episode of Walking with Dinosaurs than the one I assigned to you is not a dinosaur, but a, a close relative of dinosaurs and crocodiles. And it looks kind of like a running crocodile. Crocodiles actually also evolved during this period. Um, and they were some of the only other members of this evolutionary radiation to survive the Triassic, because as it turns out, dinosaurs would be extremely successful and would outcompete most of these other reptiles. Now, the dinosaurs do survive today in the form of birds, but they would, they don't dominate the same way they did during the Mesozoic. And that's why the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous are known as the age of dinosaurs the surviving synapsids would last until the end of the Triassic and they would evolve into true mammals at the very end of the Triassic. And mammals would, mammals would continue to exist, but mostly in roles where they ate rotting plants, insects, or weren't the dominant largest animals. And they were often nocturnal as well, like many mammals are today. Meanwhile, the plants we had were not flowering plants at all. They were cycads, which are look vaguely like palm trees, but don't actually have flowers. They make a little cone in the middle, and their their uh, leaves are spinier. Various conifers, like junipers and pines, and various ferns and horsetails in wetter areas. Flowering plants would not evolve at all until the Cretaceous period and wouldn't dominate until the age of mammals, really. Dinosaurs, for the most part, did not eat flowering plants. And there's some people that think that they went into decline near the end of the Cretaceous because they couldn't deal with flowering plants, at least with eating them. Now, Lystrosaurus, which is this hippopotamus-like creature here, is one of the mammal ancestors from the early Triassic. It's not directly ancestral to us, but it is a close relative of um, this other animal that I'll talk about later that is actually in the group that is directly ancestral to us. And it's important because it was discovered, um, it was discovered in Antarctica. Actually, it was one of the first, first ancient vertebrates or animals with backbones discovered in Antarctica. And um, 
the article one in the paleontology articles is a summary of its discovery in Antarctica, the rocks it was found in, the type of paleo environment they think it lived in, using the sediments, um, using the sedimentary rocks it was discovered in, they can make guesses about what sort of place it lived. And they came up with the conclusion that even though it's found now in the cold frozen wastelands of Antarctica, it lived in a delta or swamp-like environment. And it being found in Antarctica, as well as in India and Africa, provided evidence for continental drift. And it was, um, and it was not the only mammal ancestor that was invoked to support continental drift. If you remember, the Atlantic Ocean was another place in the world where a lot of evidence for continental drift came up. And one of the fossils that they found on both sides was Cynognathus, which is this animal that's drawn to look like a tiger in this picture, although I, I don't think it had fur. I think this this artist took a little bit of liberty there. But it had a it is in the group that would evolve actually into modern mammals, and they had many features similar to modern mammals, like the like their teeth patterns. They they have the teeth patterns of modern carnivorous mammals, more or less. And they found fossils of this animal on either side of the Atlantic in rocks that are very similar in um, in Brazil and in, I guess this would be approximately Angola or the D Democratic Republic of the Congo. And so even though synapsids were declining, they still existed and they would eventually evolve into true mammals near the end of the period. And they showed up just a little bit after the first true dinosaurs evolved. Dinosaurs appear in the fossil record in what is now South America. They appear near the end of the Triassic and the first undisputed known dinosaur is Eoraptor, which vaguely resembles the later meat-eating two-legged dinosaurs like Compsognathus or Coelophysis or T-Rex. And those are all part of the Saurish and clade of dinosaurs, but Eoraptor interestingly has some features in common with the other clade of dinosaurs, which is the Ornithischians that includes Stegosaurus, Triceratops, and most other plant-eating dinosaurs. The one exception are the long neck dinosaurs are actually an offshoot of the group that includes T-Rex. Now, it appears to have been basically the ancestor of all dinosaurs. Dinosaurs appear to have showed up in South America and they have been found all over South America from the ensuing rocks that they found from later in the Triassic. And dinosaurs by the end of the Triassic had been found on every continent except for Antarctica and Australia as well. Um, they actually, the, the fossil record of, from Australian rocks is not that great. And the one purported Australian fossil that had been thought to be from, from Australia turned out to be a misidentity, turned out to be a mislabeling. Um, it was, it's a bit of a amusing and depressing story, but nobody has ever found um, fossils from Antarctica. However, the fact that dinosaurs were so prevalent in South America indicates that they had probably reached Antarctica by the end of the Triassic. We just don't have evidence of it. And we can speculate all we like. We are, again, limited by the fact that, as I mentioned before, the fossil record is a tiny fraction of the overall past diversity of life. And the dinosaurs appear to have outcompeted the various other reptiles, like the Postosuchus I showed you previously, that had evolved after the Permian extinction. And so the end of the Triassic is actually also marked by a mass extinction, not as drastic of a one as occurred at the end of the Permian period, but it's characterized by most of the competitors of the dinosaurs just dying out all at once, along with most of the remaining synapsids, except for the mammals. Um, the interesting thing about mammals is that they occupied niches that the dinosaurs didn't. They ate insects, they fed on rotting plants, they um, they burrowed, they lived in they lived in they 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 lived at night. Most dinosaurs were definitely not nocturnal, and a lot of mammals are. And the reason today that most mammals are nocturnal appears to have at least something to do with the fact that they largely evolved this way at the end of the Triassic. The only reptile, the other reptiles that survived were also mostly reptiles that occupied evolutionary roles that the dinosaurs didn't. The pterosaurs flew, then you had a bunch of swimming reptiles that aren't dinosaurs that evolved to do that since the dinosaurs really didn't outside of a very few exceptions. Um, and so the true mammals show up at the end of the Triassic, but they don't really 
even though they're more diverse, diverse than a lot of people realized, they don't become large or occupy prominent role. They don't occupy main herbivore or dominant predator roles until most dinosaurs go extinct. Now, they have found a few dinosaurs in Antarctica. The Jurassic period begins immediately after the Triassic period, and they have indeed found some dinosaurs from the Jurassic period as well as the Cretaceous period. When dinosaurs indisputably become the dominant land animals and when they become more abundant. Also, the Jurassic period is younger than the Triassic period, not by a huge amount, but we have more rocks from younger periods in Earth's time, from younger intervals in Earth's time. The closer we get to the present, the better the fossil record is going to be. And many dinosaurs likely lived in Antarctica, including a lot that we just don't have fossils of or whose fossils are buried under the ice because that challenge is present for doing geology in Antarctica. Birds are the only surviving dinosaurs and they technically still live in Antarctica. They're actually one of the few, one of the few animals that does. So it seems like there's been a lot more dinosaurs than we have fossils of, but we've found fossils of only a few dinosaurs. And the handful of fossils we've found have mostly been from the sub-Antarctic islands, which are surrounded by ocean or volcanic in many cases, and thus have better exposed rock, or on the peninsula where you have much more exposed rock, or in the trans-Antarctic mountains where the uplift from the rifting that I'll actually talk about later in this lecture uplifted a number of rocks that have dinosaurs in them. And fossils have to be studied and described before they can be named. And a number of fossil dinosaurs have been found in Antarctica, including a lot that have been in poor condition and that have not been named or formally described. Interestingly, of the only three that have been formally described, one of them, Antarctopelta, was the first dinosaur ever found in Antarctica in 1986 but it would not be given a name until almost 20 years later. So there very well might be future named or described dinosaurs as soon as scientists get to some of their remaining fossils or find better quality specimens. The, for a long time, the only Antarctic dinosaur with a name was Cryolophosaurus. This, this, um, this meat-eating dinosaur with this cool little head crest here. It was related to Allosaurus. And the picture on the left is the holotype or the original specimen of Cryolophosaurus. And it doesn't really look like a dinosaur in this form. Paleontologists have to study these rocks and use some, some human imagination in piecing together what type of animal it might have been like. For one thing, we don't know what color this would have been. So the color is largely the paleo artist's imagination here. And this fossil is jumbled but it is still quite useful as all fossils are going to be at least on some level. And it was found in, um, it was found in shale, which is a fine grained sedimentary rock formed from mud. And you can actually see the shale here as well as in the parts surrounding the bone here. It was found on an exposed part of Mount Kirkpatrick in the trans Antarctic mountains. And it was complete enough to indicate what type of dinosaur it was and for it to be given a formal name. And the skull was well preserved enough to indicate that it had this crest that it might have used for mating displays. It's one of the earliest Antarctic dinosaurs known in terms of the fossil record, but it wasn't alone almost certainly. It would have been eating plant eating dinosaurs and one of them very well might have been um, Glacialosaurus, which is also found in the early Jurassic central trans Antarctic mountain rocks. And it was a plant-eating long-necked dinosaur that very well could have coexisted with Cryolophosaurus and been one of its one of its prey items. And it is very similar to the early long-necked dinosaurs found from the Triassic. And it, it being present in Antarctica is good evidence that there were some dinosaurs present in Antarctica by the end of the Triassic, even if we don't have a great fossil record. So this animal would have been related to Apatosaurus or Brontosaurus or Brachiosaurus and Diplodocus and the other larger long-necked dinosaurs that dominated later in the Jurassic period. And it's not even the only long-necked dinosaur known from Antarctica. Um, Glacialosaurus is this big one here. This is a little one. It's actually, there's fragmentary fossils found of a, of a smaller species that seems to have lived alongside it. 
So even that indicates that there was a surprising diversity of dinosaurs living in Antarctica. We just don't have much evidence of it because we don't have a lot of rocks that we can study. Much later on, the third known and described Antarctic dinosaur is Antarctopelta, which is an ankylosaurid dinosaur, or one that was armored with a club. And it has been found in the peninsula. It's found in late Cretaceous rocks, so it did not coexist with Cryolophosaurus. And it was actually the first dinosaur ever found on the continent, but it wasn't described for many years. It's found from James Ross Island, which is named after the same person as Ross Island on the opposite side of Antarctica, but obviously they're different islands. It's confusing and sort of like, why did you have to name them both that? But anyhow, and it would not have existed with Cryolophosaurus, but it would have probably coexisted with meat-eating dinosaurs that it used its club to defend it, to defend itself from and used its armor to make itself slightly less appetizing. Um, sim because similar animals to this, like Ankylosaurus, which lives in North America, you did the exact same thing with predators like T-Rex. It's not likely that T-Rex or similar relatives to Tyrannosaurus would have been preying on this. In the Southern Hemisphere, um, you mostly have another group of meat-eating dinosaurs called the Abelosaurs. And one of them is that dinosaur with the two horns, Carnotaurus. Um, if you've seen the movie Dinosaur, that is actually the dinosaur in that. But I am getting sidetracked. Now, stepping back just a moment into the Jurassic period, Pangaea began to break up during the Jurassic. By, um, by the end of the age of dinosaurs, the Earth would look a lot like what it does now. And even in the early Jurassic, you can start to see that you're getting a northern cluster of continents and a southern cluster of continents that are behaving fairly differently. And the southern cluster of continents would start to be rifted as the Atlantic Ocean opened, and also as Africa rifted away from Antarctica. And we have evidence of this rifting in the form of the Ferrar basalts, which are when when fish when when divergent plate boundaries first open, there is a lot of volcanism. Maybe not the same level as the Siberian traps, but you get a lot of lava flowing out, and that leaves thick layers of lava behind, and that's preserved in these black strips that are basalt, a type of volcanic rock produced by these large lava flows. And you might have seen you've seen this picture before, and you might remember that the black rocks are dikes from a mountain building event in the Cambrian much before this. You can see that strat stratigraphically, those are lower down because they're older. The valley has been carved out since these rocks were put down. You get the Beacon Supergroup, which is Jurassic sandstone, and then that's from the early Jurassic. Near the end of the Jurassic, you get the Ferrar dolerites or the Ferrar basalts from, from rifting, from volcanoes erupting as Africa rift, rifted away from Antarctica. And we've found similar rocks that have the same date as this in Southern Africa, which also supports this hypothesis. And it's cool that we still have evidence of, it's cool that we still have evidence of this rifting event. It's cool that we can correlate rocks found in Antarctica with those found in Africa to see what happened on either side. And the Trans-Antarctic Mountains were formed as a rift shoulder, remember. They were formed as they were formed as an ocean began to open up between the two continents and the continental crust on either side of this new ocean was pushed up in Antarctica that produced the Trans-Antarctic Mountains. And even though they are nowhere near a plate boundary today, they once were the location of a plate boundary when a new plate boundary formed to push Antarctica and Africa away. Now, the Cretaceous period is the final and best known period of the dinosaur era because it's the most recent. It's best known because it's the most recent and the fossil record is going to be best. And Pangaea was no more by the Cretaceous period. Gondwana still existed. You still had most of the Southern continents together, but Africa had started to drift away. Nonetheless, you did not yet have an Antarctic circumpolar current because Antarctica was still well attached to Australia and it intermittently would be attached to South America as well. And with the Earth's climate being relatively warm overall, as well as the absence of a circumpolar current, it was possible for a lot more life to exist near the South Pole. As well as the North Pole, they have found a lot of dinosaur fossils from Alaska and Northern Canada and evidence indicates that some of those dinosaur herds migrated to avoid the winter darkness because 
no matter how no matter how cold or warm the earth is there's still going to be it's still going to be tilted a little bit and there is still going to be an arctic and an antarctic circle there is still going to be darkness for part of the year above the arctic circle and below the antarctic circle and the interesting thing about australia and antarctica at the south pole is that they had vast forests covering them and there were herds of dinosaurs living there as well a lot of australia was australia was closer to the south pole it Antarctica was farther north than it is, and Australia was farther south. And Australia experienced darkness akin to the modern polar night. Even when the Earth is warmer, again, we're still going to have the polar night. And what would happen is that you had you would have the plants go dormant, simply just simply just not growing um, for part of the year, and dinosaurs would either migrate or they would overwinter. The smaller dinosaurs seem to have overwintered and um, the Walking with Dinosaurs episode I have you watch shows Lelanosaura, which is this um, small plant-eating dinosaur digging up buried plants over the winter to survive. Not all of them make it, of course. Um, and it shows larger herbivorous dinosaurs, like the Mutabarasaurus, migrating away. And dinosaurs, at least some dinosaurs, were definitely warm-blooded because the birds, which are agreed to be descended from them, are also warm-blooded. and it seems that a it seems that most of the dinosaurs that lived near that lived in Australia and Antarctica near the South Pole must have been warm blooded to be able to survive the polar winter. And the clip does, I think, a nice job of just illustrating what this polar dinosaur community would have looked like. The animals shown lived in Australia, but similar animals almost certainly lived in Antarctica very possibly the same ones because the two continents were essentially the same continent. You just don't have as many rocks from Antarctica again. And, and so, uh, um, in addition to dinosaurs, it also shows um, a giant amphibian, Kulasuchus, thriving. And it suggests that Kulasuchus might have survived in Antarctica by, or in, Arctic, in Australia by basically freezing during the winter the same way that some, that some, um, that some frogs do so in, in Alaska and Northern Canada today. And the water was too cold for crocodiles. Um, crocodiles are not going to have as easy of a time as freezing and surviving in suspended animation as frogs or these giant amphibians. And so Kulasuchus seems to have survived there for longer because of this. And there was just a very interesting community of dinosaurs living there, different from what you'd have in the Northern Hemisphere. Evidence suggests that some surviving relatives of Allosaurus might have lived there longer, longer after, long after most relatives of Allosaurus had died out. And there was just this community, there's just this biological community there that doesn't really have, doesn't really have, doesn't really have as much of an equivalent today. You don't have, you, you, you still have, of course, near the poles, periods of complete darkness and periods of 24 hour daylight. But since the climate of Earth is colder and drier overall right now, you don't have quite this boom in biological productivity in terms of having a large forest there. But anyhow, a very different world. So near the end of the age of dinosaurs, the breakup of Pangaea was basically complete. You have a, large, a larger Atlantic Ocean um, forming between Africa and South America. You actually have much of much of North America flooded by seaways, largely because sea level was higher, because there weren't any glaciers whatsoever. Um, what would happen actually is that Africa would get closer to Eurasia and close off the Tethys Sea and leave the Mediterranean as its only remnant. India would eventually hit the will eventually hit the rest of Eurasia. And you can see here that Australia and Antarctica are still basically one continent. And South America and Antarctica are close by, and they would be attached on and off throughout the end of the age of dinosaurs and early on into the age of mammals. And you start seeing endemism, you start seeing dinosaurs that, you, you, you start seeing different lineages of dinosaurs dominating on different continents because there's more geographic isolation. And you also see something of a decline in the dinosaur diversity. Dinosaurs would survive until the end of the Cretaceous, but they declined in diversity along with many other marine organisms. And one hypothesis as to why this happened is that there was another 
large volcanic episode near the end of the Cretaceous in India, in the Deccan region. There is a gigantic lava flow known as the Deccan Traps. And they did not produce as an extreme eruption as the Siberian Traps. They, didn't, they don't seem to have ignited coal seams, but they still do appear to have affected the climate quite a bit and caused ocean acidification. And this appears to have caused ecological instability even before the asteroid impact more or less wiped all the dinosaurs out and brought an end to the Mesozoic era. And this cataclysm was, this cataclysm is always, it's, it's attracted attention in the imagination just because of the what if question it generates. What would happen if we were hit by a gigantic asteroid? Well, when this happened at the end of the Cretaceous period, a, an asteroid about this size, so this is not a trivial, this is, this is not a tiny, this is not a meteorite, this is not like a little rock hitting the earth, this is, this is, has a diameter larger than some countries. A large asteroid hits off, hits off the coast of Mexico, and the impact is large enough to melt the crust. They have evidence that this happened by the existence of a rock called tektite, which forms when the impact of an asteroid rapidly heats the Earth's crust, and then it cools in the air and forms this glassy texture. It also just released a lot of debris into the air period, which is what this artist's impression is trying to indicate. And the debris became airborne and significantly reduced the amount of solar, radi solar radiation reaching the Earth's surface for a while. Particulate matter in the air blocks sunlight by reflecting it back into the space and reduces the amount of solar radiation that is available for photosynthesis, for plants to make food with. And if plants cannot make their food, if plants cannot photosynthesize, then the plant eating dinosaurs or whatever plant eating large animals are present will die out. And most carnivores will then die out because they have no large herbivores to feed on. For a long time, it was a mystery as to what had killed the dinosaurs off. They were not able to identify the Chicxulub crater until underwater surveys made them realize that this, this depression on the edge of the Yucatan Peninsula was actually part of a gigantic crater, that, that this was actually from an ancient asteroid impact, and they could see the shape of the crater offshore. And radioactive dating of the tektites indicated that this crater had formed at 65 million years ago. Um, the tektites, the rocks that form from the impact are actually, can actually be dated using radioactive decay. Um, they also found that the rocks from around 65 million years ago, not just those in Mexico, but worldwide, had a spike in the amount of iridium present. And iridium is a transition metal and one of the heavier metals that is very uncommon on Earth, but it's very common in space junk like meteorites and asteroids. And the hypothesis is that the asteroid debris, which contains iridium, ended up all over the world and settled around 65 million years, million years ago. And 65 million years ago is, in the rock record, is marked by the abrupt disappearance of all of the dinosaurs except for birds. The large herbivorous dinosaurs went extinct because they didn't have enough plants to eat, and the large carnivorous dinosaurs died out because they no longer had any Triceratops or Parasaurolophus or other plant-eating dinosaurs to eat. The survivors mostly included small animals or scavengers or marine animals. Marine animals actually seem to have been less affected by this mass extinction than land animals, and that kind of makes sense um, because it's more because the marine food chain is more heavily based on phytoplankton, on swimming, on tiny microscopic algae that live in the ocean water, which we'll talk more about on Wednesday's lecture. And they are obviously going to see their levels decline from the loss of sunlight, but they are going to have a better, there's more of them are going to survive than larger land plants. And so the marine food chain didn't collapse quite as badly, but the big marine reptiles still went extinct. The pterosaurs, the flying reptiles went extinct, ammonites in the ocean went extinct, the, the, the coiled shelled relatives of octopuses that you see fossils of. Um, mammals survived as a group since most of them were small and a lot of them scavenged and some small birds survived. A lot of the birds went extinct too, but the, a, a number of physically small groups of birds did survive. And then crocodiles made it through. Um, 
largely because they largely because they were able to scavenge. So this brought an end to the age of dinosaurs and an end to a different era. And with the mammals being some of the only survivors, they would fill many of the gaps left behind by the extinction of dinosaurs. So the Cenozoic era, and Cenozoic means recent life, that begins immediately after the 65 million year mark at which most dinosaurs went extinct and it continues into the present day. And climate wise, it was characterized by a gradual cooling of earth. And this would benefit warm blooded creatures like birds and mammals that had survived the extinction. And the Eocene epoch, which is a subdivision of the Neogene period is when most modern lineages of mammals experience their own little evolutionary explosion. It's when you see the first ancestors of horses, which started out as these little forest creatures, actually. But you start seeing early um, horses and primates and true carnivores, the group that includes cats and dogs, showing up. And mammals would indeed live in Antarctica for much of the Cenozoic. You would get mammals, um, including some that resemble mammals found in South America and Australia, because they would be, those two continents were connected to Antarctica still. Um, but Antarctica would get ominously colder as you, as you, as it's, as, as you, as the last connection from South America was lost and as the Tasman Strait between Australia and Antarctica opened up. Eocene Antarctica was largely covered not in so much tropical forests, but in what you'd, forests similar to what you would see in Northern Europe or actually in New Zealand and parts of Australia now. It was largely covered in a plant, in forests of a plant called Nothophagus which is a flower, it's a flowering plant. By this point, flowering plants were the dominant plant life on earth and the forests looked different from those that had dominated for much of the dinosaur era. You still have conifers, but not as many of them and you have a lot more flowering trees now. And Nothophagus today is still found in New Caledonia and New Zealand and those were part of the Zealandia subcontinent and they are found in Australia. And fossils that clearly are Nothophagus are found in Antarctica all throughout the Eocene. And that indicates that it was spread across Antarctica. And the paleontology article three that I had you read talks about the evidence of finding forests in Antarctica and also finding subtleties in the forests that they have evidence of in West Antarctica versus those they have in East Antarctica. And it's interesting to think about just the diversity of plants and forest life that once lived on this continent. And one thing to note about Nothophagus is that it has, it has small serrated leaves. It has the type of leaves that you find in areas that are relatively cool. Less surface area means the plants do better, do better in cold areas. And it also is a plant that loses its leaves in the winter. Antarctica was now had noticeable seasons. Um, it had cooled to around 10 degrees Celsius in summer by this time. So survivable, but no longer a tropical paradise. And Outside of the ancestors of horses, you saw a couple of their fossils on the previous slide. They have found a number of land mammals that were the last land mammals in, in Antarctica. As we'll talk about in the second part of this lecture, there aren't any land mammals living in Antarctica today. You still have seals and whales, marine mammals, but those mostly came from elsewhere. Um, you don't have many descendants, you don't really have any descendants of the land mammals in Antarctica still surviving. All of these would go extinct when the Antarctic circumpolar current opened up. But you have mammals like this Antarctodon, which is a distant relative of modern hoofed mammals um, like cows and hippos. You have some true horses. Um, this fossil jaw is from a, from a genus called Sudamerica. And it's an herbivorous mammal that's not clearly related to any modern groups because a lot of mammal groups showed up early in the age of mammals to take advantage of the disappearance of dinosaurs, the same way that dinosaurs and a bunch of other reptiles appeared at, at the start of the Triassic to fill in the niches that had been occupied by the mammal ancestors that had mostly gone extinct with the Permian extinction. And a lot of these early mammal lineages don't have descendants alive today, but we still have fossils of them. A lot of the dinosaurs, excuse me, a lot of the mammals found from Antarctica have been found in a pretty fragmentary condition because you have more rocks exposed from the Cenozoic than you do from the Triassic because they're younger, but you still have the problem of most of the rocks being covered by ice. But the cool thing is that you still find some, you find some 
um, Sudamerica, for example, is an example of one that is found in both Antarctica and Patagonia, and that indicates that there was still a land connection between South America and Antarctica for at least part of the Eocene. And there was clearly plenty of plant life also. If you had, you had sizable mammals surviving, and there was clearly plenty for them to eat. You also have the ancestors of penguins showing up, and unlike mammals, penguins, unlike land mammals, penguins would actually survive the transition from the from Antarctica being habitable to Antarctica being like it is now. So they found fossils that resemble penguins from the Mesozoic of Antarctica, as well as Australia and New Zealand. So penguins as a group appear to have been around for quite a while, but animals that definitely belong to the penguin group are first identified from the Eocene epoch, around 37 million years, at the same time as the mammals on the last slide were around. And these penguins were a lot larger than um, modern day penguins, like this um, Paleoeudipides um, is about, stands about one and a half times as tall as the modern emperor penguin. So that would have been really cool to see, gigantic penguins, but we don't have those anymore, sadly. They may have been larger because food was more abundant, but they appear to have lived a similar aquatic lifestyle. Penguins were already adapting to live in the ocean in the early Eocene, it seems. And this is probably what let them survive. They, um, the oceans, as we'll learn, are still biologically productive enough to support a thriving ecosystem. And so you still have penguins as well as whales and seals out in the ocean. And so dinosaurs in the form of penguins and other, and other seabirds have had one of the longest and most continuous presences on the Antarctic continent of any group of animals. So I think that's very cool. Um, one cool thing is that penguins are not that closely related to some of the other flightless birds like ostriches, emus, rheas, um, and kiwis. Those are all part of a group called the ratites, although I've seen some papers indicating that some of those might actually be only fairly distantly related. But penguins are not very closely related to emus and ostriches at all, and that's a good example of convergent evolution when you have two very different organisms evolving similar traits. Um, but Either way, either way, we don't have ostriches in Antarctica. We might have had their ancestors living there. Um, we still do have penguins living in Antarctica, and they would be one of the very few survivors of the isolation of Antarctica. The world was already getting colder worldwide. The, the world got colder as you got away from the dinosaur era. Antarctica in particular would get colder when South America separated for good from Antarctica and formed the modern day Drake Passage. and Afterwards, it would get even colder when Australia separated from Antarctica for good and the Tasman Sea became a permanent fixture. By 30 million years, Antarctica was completely isolated and the, these gateways, a gateway in a geologic sense is a term for a passage through which water can flow. And once the gateways around Antarctica were formed, the Antarctic circumpolar current could develop and that encircled the continent in an unbroken loop isolating the continent from warm currents and helping expedite the formation of an ice cap. The Oligocene epoch is, follows the Eocene and it is when we start to get modern Antarctica. We start seeing an ice cap and we start seeing an ice cap near the end of the Oligocene, the first permanent ice we've had since the Permian, since before the age of dinosaurs. And the Antarctic circumpolar current caused the Southern ice cap to form sooner than the Northern ice cap. Glaciers didn't immediately cover the entire continent and you still had warmer areas supporting small populations of mammals in temperate forests for a while, but we don't have any of these refugia existing today. Antarctica by the, definitely by the Pliocene and almost certainly by the end of the Miocene had become too cold to support basically any land life. And today Antarctica is desolate. The land diversity is limited to a small number of hardy plants lichens, mosses, and some, some arthropods. Now, the remaining part of this lecture will be devoted to the survivors who still live in Antarctica after the opening of the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, midges, extremophile microorganisms, lichens, and a few others. The much more abundant marine life will be the subject of lecture eight on Wednesday. And we'll talk more about, we'll talk about why the ocean has continued to support life, even though the land in Antarctica has become barren. And I will see you in the second half of this lecture. 
to start with some announcements and then to finish up with what is left of Antarctica's terrestrial biodiversity.